Hello everyone and welcome to our biology class. We'll be using Concepts of Biology by OpenStax. There's a picture of what our book looks like. OpenStax offers those textbooks for free on their website, but you can also order print copies if that's what you'd like. But uh, what I like about the digital free copy is that there's links and things that can help to deepen learning. So for chapter one, we've got two sections. We'll be looking at themes and concepts of biology and the process of science. So let's get started. We start off with a picture of Earth that you probably are familiar with, probably seen this a lot. And I don't know if you know this, but NASA scientists actually had to combine different observations of different parts of the planet to come up with this representation of Earth. What makes Earth special from the different planets in our solar system? Look at the land masses and the water. You can see the clouds in the atmosphere. Just a very wonderful place with much mystery that we're trying to figure out. Viewed from space, Earth offers few clues about the diversity of life that resides here. The first forms of life on Earth are thought to have been microorganisms that existed for billions of years before plants and animals even appeared. The mammals, birds, and flowers so familiar to us are all relatively recent. Originating 130 to 200 million years ago, humans have inhabited the planet for only the last two and a half million years, and only in the last 200,000 years have humans started looking like we do today. All right, so in our first section of the chapter, here's our learning goals to be able to identify and describe the properties of life to describe the levels of organization among living things, and to list examples of different sub-disciplines in biology. So a little careers reminder there. So as biologists, biologists are scientists that study life. They're continually trying to answer many questions about life on Earth, but here's the top four. What are the shared properties that make something alive? If we could go to another planet or somewhere else in the universe, how would we know if we come across something, whether it's alive or not? How do various living things function? How do we organize the different kinds of organisms so that we can better understand them? That is one of the human-like properties is to, besides making sense of the world around us, to organize it, which actually helps us understand it better by looking at similarities and differences. And then how did all this diversity arise and how is it continuing on earth? Maybe even how is it affecting us as well? So what is biology? Bio, the prefix, means life and an ology is a study of something. So biology is a systematic study of life. All of our life on Earth, can you guess how many uh, living things we've come across? Well, supposedly we've only discovered about a fraction of what lives on Earth. We haven't even uh, ventured everywhere that we can go on Earth yet. And some things are so very small that they're hard to see, hard to study. So we haven't discovered everything yet, but we discover new species each year. We have to study and catalog those things and organize them. And uh, unfortunately, things become extinct as well. So once they disappear from Earth, they're gone forever. So let's start off with the properties of life. Life's characteristics. If I could go somewhere, what would be my checklist? Well, in different textbooks, they may state these things different ways or group them into smaller, more specific, or bigger categories. But in this textbook, there's eight of them. These are in no particular order. And we're going to take a look at each of these things. Order, response to stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, 
homeostasis and energy processing. Some of these are a little more straightforward than others. How about viruses? We've all been affected by viruses so much lately. Are they on the list of living things on Earth? Most scientists say no, because they do not show all of these eight characteristics or eight properties of life. They do some of them, but not all of them. We'll revisit that later. So let's start with organization. Living things are very highly organized. So let's start with our smallest unit of organization, and those are atoms. And we actually have this in common with all matter. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So we have in common with all matter that we consist of atoms. And then atoms build a larger subunit called molecules, and then molecules make even a bigger thing yet called macromolecules. Molecules then make up the little cell working parts called organelles, and those organelles work together to make cells. Moving up different levels, uh, we'll do a big jump here, cells make up organisms. But in between there, we could say that cells build tissues, tissues build organs, and organs build systems, and then those organ systems go on to build organisms. So that's called a hierarchy of organization. And all living things, whether they are single-celled or multi-celled like us, are very highly organized. Here's some key terms. Once in a while, you'll see a slide that has key terms with definitions on it. If the, maybe some of the previous slides use some vocabulary words, we can stop and make sure that we actually understand what those vocabulary words mean. So I uh, will encourage you to stop and then make sure you understand each of these words for the chapter. And speaking of molecules, atoms getting together to build molecules and then build macromolecules. Macro means big. It's a big molecule. DNA, this is the genetic material that all living things on Earth use. Uh, this is a macromolecule. And we'll be seeing this many times throughout biology. It's another picture. This toad represents a highly organized structure consisting of cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems. And we could put any living thing in that picture and say the same thing about it. And this is a picture from our textbook showing that hierarchy in a more visual manner. There's also organization among organisms that we, we can go to bigger levels yet beyond just the living organism. That organisms of the same species can make up a group called a population. A population is a group of individuals who are all of the same species living in an area. They can interbreed with each other and create viable fertile offspring with each other. That's the biological definition of a population that we'll be using throughout this course. Populations then can build communities. A community contains different types of species. And they're all living usually in the similar area, so then they're interacting with one another. And then different community, communities interact, and not only with just the living parts, but also the non-living parts of their area, like water and soil and air. And then that builds an ecosystem. And then all of the living things on Earth live in what's called the biosphere all the regions on earth that hold life. And that can include, of course, the land, but can also include water. And then even portions of the atmosphere can support life. All right, on to number two on our list of characteristics of life. Every organism senses and responds to conditions inside and outside of itself. Therefore, we say they can respond to stimuli. 
like, for instance, the leaves of this sensitive plant. You touch it, it actually will kind of fold in on itself. It's kind of interesting. If you go to the digital textbook, there will be a link there that you can watch that happening. Think about for a moment how you respond to stimuli in your life. An example of a stimulus might be touching a hot stove. How do you respond to that? Well, you jerk your hand away. Reproduction, number three on our list. All living things must reproduce. Well, they reproduce by duplicating their DNA. And if they're single-celled, then they just divide their cell in two. It's called asexual reproduction. But what about multi-celled creatures like us? We have to produce specialized reproductive cells to form new, new individuals through a process called meiosis. And fertilization have, has to happen. Uh, different organisms, different uh, species, have different strategies to reproduce. But it all boils down to making new offspring and those new offspring inheriting DNA from their parents. Therefore, those new offspring through that inheritance will have traits or characteristics similar to their parents. Reproduction also ensures the survival of a species and keeps it going, keeps it from going extinct. How can you resist a picture of cute kittens here? Although no two look alike, these kittens have inherited genes from both parents and share many of the same characteristics. An example of reproduction and inheritance of inheriting the genes or the DNA from their parents. Adaptation is next on our list for properties of living things. All living things exhibit a fit, I've got that in quotations there, a fit to their environment. Adaptations are defined as beneficial traits. They're caused by your genes that you inherited from your parents. Or they could also be caused by new genes inherited by mutation as well. Some genes will make you fit for your environment and some won't. The more adaptations you have, the more fit for your environment you'll be. Fitness is defined as being able to survive and reproduce in your environment and therefore create more offspring. And we'll get to that when we talk more about natural selection and evolution. So again, adaptations enhance survive, reproductive potential of the individual, increasing ability to survive and reproduce. So right there, that's basically our definition of natural selection. Those individuals who are best fit for their environment, or who have the best traits or adaptations for their environment, will be more likely to survive and then therefore reproduce and pass those adaptations onto their offspring. Of course, Adaptations are not static. They can change because obviously environments change. We have things working on Earth like continental drift where continents move and therefore uh, maybe at uh, some point you're close to the equator but the continent is moving and getting uh, further and further north where it's colder. Again, that may take thousands or millions of years but uh, things change, therefore adaptations change and organisms change as well. How about some adaptations for a polar bear? Can you look at a polar bear and think about the beneficial traits that it has? Growth and development is next on our list. Organisms grow and develop according to specific instructions encoded in their genes or DNA. Like the genes tell the cells what to do and when to do it. And this ensures a species offspring will exhibit many of the same characteristics as their parents. Again, we have some key terms listed here. So I encourage you at any time to stop the video or look at the notes and make sure you know what those terms mean. 
Regulation next on our list. All living organisms require multiple regulatory mechanisms to coordinate the many internal functions that are happening all the time. So here's some examples. How does your body transport nutrients? How does it uh, regulate that? How do you respond to stimuli? How do you, in, you cope with environmental stresses? How do you get rid of waste from your body? How do you cool your body? How do you warm up? Those are some examples of regulation. And very, uh, very closely related to regulation is homeostasis. So homeostasis means maintaining a dynamic equilibrium, maintaining a balance, even though things around you, things externally are constantly changing. How do you maintain a balance? So it turns out that cells in living organisms often require appropriate or very specific conditions that must be maintained within a narrow range often. So a great example is maintaining your body temperature. What's our body temperature? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. How do you do that? Well, you're able to do it, obviously. If you weren't able, then you wouldn't be considered living or you would no longer uh, continue with life. But you're able to do that. Maintain that balance. That's called thermoregulation. Maintaining your blood pressure within a narrow range. Maintaining a heart rate within a narrow range. Salinity is the amount of salts or solutes that are in the liquids in your body. How do you maintain that? And pH, how acidic or how basic are the fluids in your cells? Next on our list is energy processing. All organisms use a source of energy for their metabolic activities to sustain themselves. So as a little side note, energy is the capacity to do work. You may remember from past classes some different types of energy like heat energy, light energy. Uh, often with organisms we talk about chemical energy, the energy that we receive from chemicals. And we get that type of energy from the nutrients that we eat. Nutrients are substances and organisms an organism needs for growth and survival but can't make itself. So if you're an organism like a plant or an algae or a certain type of bacteria called cyanobacteria, you are a producer. So you have a special ability to do photosynthesis, which is making your own energy or basically making your own sugar, making your own food, which then you can get the energy from that. So that's where you take carbon dioxide out of the air and water and the energy of sunlight and convert it to food or sugar. If you can do that, you're a producer. But uh, humans like us are not producers, we're consumers. We actually have to ingest our food. We rely on the producers to get what we need. So we have to eat things to get our chemical energy. And that's called uh, doing cell respiration. When we take the food that we eat and we convert it into energy, that's cellular respiration. And we'll be talking more about that during this course. If you are a producer, you can actually do both processes, both photosynthesis and cell respiration. But if you're a consumer, you only do cell respiration. All right, so now that we've completed our list of the properties of life, things that unify us, that make us all similar, no matter if we're a lowly single-celled bacteria living in the armpit of a rhinoceros, just making that up off the top of my head, or we are a very complex mammal like a human or a giraffe, we have those things in common. But obviously, there is a diversity of life out there. If we look at all living forms, uh, we can definitely see, maybe even see this more than the universe, or the, the unity is the diversity. So besides unity, life also has great diversity.
and those observable characteristics vary tremendously among organisms. Biodiversity is the sum of differences among living things. The definition of a variation is a difference, and I may use that word during this course. And our source of diversity is evolution. We often talk about natural selection, but there are other ways that evolution also occurs that creates variations or diversity as well that we'll eventually get to. And as humans, we like to keep track of the diversity of life and classification systems help us do that, help us organize all that life out there. We've been trying to classify all that life for more than 2,000 years, but some of the systems that we use today come from the 18th century with an individual named Carolus Linnaeus who helped us organize life and he grouped them into different taxa or specific classification groups based on the traits that they shared and we still use this today he created what's called binomial nomenclature which is giving organisms a specific scientific name that can be used throughout the world no matter what country you are you are in it's usually based on latin or greek as those are uh, some languages that don't change a lot and don't have much slang to them. Uh, you may uh, recognize our scientific name as Homo sapiens, or maybe like a wolf, Canis lupus, or a cat. We used to call them uh, Felis domesticus, but now they're called Felis catus, as these classification systems may change as we make new discoveries. So the first part of our scientific name Carolus Linnaeus called our genus. And the second part is the species. This is the most specific part. Again, a species is something that can mate with one another and create viable fertile offspring with one another. As of right now, if I talk about Homo sapiens, there are no other individuals on the earth right now that we know of that share our same genus. Uh, so we are the only ones of the genus Homo on this earth. But uh, at one time, there were other individuals on this earth that had our same genus. We'll talk about that at a later date. Uh, our, if we talk about other levels of classification, the genus and the species are the most specific, but we can go more general that uh, groups of genus can make up... Uh, a family and families, different family groups can make up different orders. So currently there are eight levels in our taxonomic system that we use today. So down here, if we use a dog and a wolf as an example, uh, that species lupus would be the name for a wolf and a familiaris is the dog's species name, or at least what it used to be, unless they've changed it on me. Canis is both of their genus, but also for a coyote as well. And then we move further up, getting less and less specific. We've got family, and then we've got order. You get more individuals belonging to these levels, get up to mammals. Remember what makes a mammal is that they're warm-blooded, they have fur, they feed their young milk using mammary glands. Then chordata, that's our phylum, and that actually means we have a backbone or at one time had something that resembled a backbone during our development. And kingdom, here, our kingdom is Animalia. As of right now, there are six kingdoms. When I went to high school, there were five kingdoms, but now they've made six. So those kingdoms are animal and plant, probably our most familiar ones. Then there's fungi, protists, and then there's two that belong to bacteria. And that's what split into two. They used to be together in a kingdom called Monera, but now they're separated into two separate kingdoms, either called just bacteria or eubacteria. And then 
archaea or archaebacteria. In the 1990s, they created domains, which are at the top of the list here. And there's only three domains. Those are basically based on the type of cell that the individual has. Uh, life on Earth has evolved along these three lineages, which has helped create these three domains. So this is also something that changed for me since I was in high school. Bacteria, or eubacteria, you may hear it said as, archaea, and then eukarya. So bacteria and archaeans are basically bacteria. They're single-celled. Um, we call them prokaryotes. They don't have a nucleus that houses their DNA. The DNA just kind of floats in their cytoplasm. So just a little bit set up, a little bit different setup for their cell. Uh, we're probably more familiar with the bacteria as we hear about those like uh, Staphylococcus or Staph infections or Strep, Streptococcus bacteria, E. coli. We hear about those causing illnesses. Uh, Archaeans may be a little less familiar with. They include many what are called extremophiles because they live in very harsh conditions. So those are prokaryotes. Those are cells that don't have a nucleus. And uh, bacteria and archaeans, besides being kingdoms on their own, they, they get their own domain and their own kingdom. But uh, eukaryotes, eukarya, is a domain, and we share that with the four other kingdoms here. Protists, plants, fungi, and animals all have to share the domain eukarya because our cells are all similar. We have a eukaryotic cell, a cell that has a nucleus which houses our DNA, plus we have other little organelles that have membranes around them and do very specific functions. And when we get to our chapter on cells, we'll study that a little more in depth. So here's a picture of some bacteria here. A uh, picture of where archaeans may live in some extreme conditions, such as boiling hot springs or salty areas or freezing conditions. And then a plant and an animal who would belong to the domain eukarya because of our eukaryotic nucleus-containing cells. This is called a phylogenetic tree of life. Phylogenetic tree. So the common ancestor to all life would be down here at the bottom of this branch. From that life, which is thought to be a certain type of prokaryote, all life would branch from that as it changed. And if you look at bacteria, it goes that way. And you'll notice on our branch, which one are we most closely related to? Actually, we're more closely related to the archaeans than we are to the bacteria. We come from the same branch that archaeans come from. Our common ancestor would be here. And then finally, keep going towards our branch of eukarya. Then we can see where some of the protists branch off here, uh, plants and fungi and animals. This helps to kind of show that, yes, there's a great diversity of life, but can also show our similarities our unifying principles as well. So let's talk about jobs here, careers in biology. The scope of biology is broad and contains many branches and subdivisions. I've given you some examples here. Can you think about what these types of scientists might study? One of my favorites is zoology or zoology. The prefix zo means animals. So these are biologists who study animals. So I love that area of science. I love animals. Uh, microbiology, micro means small, so those are biologists who study microscopic or very small organisms. So biologists continue to decipher mysteries about life. We don't know everything there is to know out there. So we've got a lot left to learn, and all these different areas of biology can work together to help solve some of those mysteries of life. And even if you're not going into biology or scientific field, knowledge of biology, 
because it is the study of life, can benefit anyone in any field. Here's an example of a paleontologist doing their work studying old life, such as dinosaurs or woolly mammoths, when they dig them up and study the fossils left behind. How about a forensic scientist? This was a field that gained a lot of traction in uh, well, the 1990s and 2000s. Gained a lot of TV shows centered around forensic science, being able to look at uh, DNA and information and evidence left at crime scenes. So speaking of life on Earth, the first life may have looked very similar to something like this. Uh, these are called blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, and they leave these types of structures called stromatolites behind. And some of our oldest evidence of life on Earth are these fossilized stromatolites. And we can infer that bacteria make these things today, and we can then uh, surmise that, yes, they made them in the past as well, and we have the fossils with the evidence to show that. Now we enter our second section of our chapter. Might be a good time to take a, a break and review what we've already learned before you move on. And uh, so this is section 1.2, the process of science. Our learning goals here are to identify the shared characteristics of the natural scientist, sciences, to understand the process of scientific inquiry, Compare inductive reasoning with deductive reasoning and describe the goals of basic science and applied science. So biology is a natural science. These are fields of science related to the physical world and its phenomena and processes. Science actually comes from a word that means to know, to gather information about the world around you. All right, uh, some scientists may divide up the life sciences and physical sciences as different natural sciences as well. So there's some disagreement as how that might be divided up. But the nature of science is that it helps us to be objective about our observations by addressing what we observe. It involves making, testing, and evaluating hypotheses and using logical thinking methods called inductive and deductive reasoning. So use these types of skills, whether you're in biology or life sciences or in physical sciences, we have this in common, that we're being objective, we're making observations, we're testing things by uh, using scientific method, making hypotheses, and we're using logical thinking methods called inductive and deductive reasoning. So the nature of science and scientific inquiry. So scientists work together and use critical thinking, which is judging the quality of information before accepting it. Notice I'm not using the word believe here. We don't believe things in science. We accept them or we uh, reject them if we falsify them. So scientists make and test potentially falsifiable predictions about how the natural world works. And we address only what is observable. So generally a researcher will observe something in nature and then use inductive reasoning to form a hypothesis and then use deductive reasoning to make a prediction about what might occur if the hypothesis is not wrong. So here's some terms here to make sure we understand what these words mean. A hypothesis, often when I ask students what's a hypothesis, they say it's an educated guess. But I would like us to go further than that, that uh, we're doing more than guessing here. We are actually making a very logical prediction as to what we think is going to happen 
when we're testing a natural phenomenon. So inducting, inductive reasoning is basically a conclusion based on an observation. So let's say that I get up every morning and I see the sun in my east window. And I do that every day for a year. So I'm making these observations. The sun is always coming up in the east. So I might draw an inductive conclusion that the sun rises in the east based on those observations that I make every day. Now obviously if I wake up on a morning and the sun's coming up in the west, I might have to change uh, what's, what I'm thinking. I might have to change my conclusion, but that's just an example of an inductive reasoning. Then deductive reasoning is using a general idea to make a conclusion about a specific case. Often with deductive reasoning, you want to look for how it's stated, and you often find it with an if-then statement. In fact, I often encourage students that when they're making hypotheses to use that deductive reasoning because a hypothesis is a prediction, so use if-then. That way we are making a, a, our deductive reasoning, we're using our deductive reasoning skills. So using an if-then. So here's an example of a, a deductive reasoning using an if-then statement. If the climate is warming in an area, then the distribution of plants and animals will change. So a good example of deductive reasoning there. Here's another example. Let's say I'm doing an experiment with plants and growing them. So I might say something in my uh, hypothesis like this. If plants require light for growth, then they will not grow if I put them in a dark cabinet. Maybe I'm a student doing a science fair project. That could be an example of a hypothesis that uh, is using deductive reasoning. So again, look for that if-then statement, which then helps us uh, make things logical. Use those critical thinking skills. So often with science, we hear about the scientific method. Often we might see a diagram like uh, this one right here. This is a few slides down. Uh, this is a very uh, like a rigid way to do science. Not all science uses every step of the scientific method, but generally to follow some sort of formal way to do your experiment. All right, back to the slide we were on. So making, testing, and evaluating hypotheses is the scientific method. So basically, you start with questions about the world around you. From those questions, you make predictions, and then you can test them with experiments or observations or both. Experiments typically are performed on an experimental group, and you also compare that with a control group, such as, uh, let's go back to my plant experiment that growing plants in the dark, that that would be my experimental group. If I restate my hypothesis that I had earlier. If plants require light to grow, then they will not grow if I put them in a dark cabinet. So that would be my experimental group. But uh, you also need a control group, something to compare that with, to make sure that uh, our experiment is actually working and the thing that I'm testing is actually affecting the uh, experimental group. So I have a control group. So can you guess what the control group for that experiment would be? So that control group then should be plants grown regularly in sunlight or some type of grow light that they would need. I would want to make sure that when I'm doing that experiment that everything is kept the same. They're in the same type of soil, the same size of pot, they're the same type of plant, they get the same amount of water and fertilizer. I want to control all those variables because I really want to make sure that if my plants don't grow that it's the variable that I'm testing which is growing them in the dark, that that's actually what's affecting the results. All right. We can also do science with models and computers. That's some of the newer technology that's out there. But basically, I do my experiment and I collect data 
and I draw conclusions from that data. Data can be qualitative, which is more like uh, observations, or it can be quantitative, which contains numbers and measurements. Uh, so if a hypothesis is not consistent with the data, it can be modified. When I make a hypothesis in scientists, we want to make sure that that hypothesis is testable and we're able to falsify it or disprove it. So let's say we can, in science, we can fail to disprove a hypothesis. So there, therefore, you might want to say, oh, I proved my hypothesis. But actually, in science, we don't like to say we prove stuff. We like to say we failed to disprove it. I know it sounds kind of technical there, but that's uh, one of the ways that we do science. We always want to leave room for uh, further experimentation. So we don't say we prove things. We failed to disprove it, or we failed to falsify that hypothesis. Now, if we do falsify a hypothesis, that might lead us into more questions and further testing and further hypotheses to figure out what's going on and lo learn more about the world around us. So uh, I like to uh, use an example uh, for a scientific method experiment is uh, something that might happen to you in everyday life. So let's say that uh, you have a flashlight and you turn it on and it doesn't work. So uh, in your head you start doing this critical thinking about it. You're actually kind of doing the scientific method there even though you may not completely realize that's what's going on in your head. But uh, you might make a hypothesis that um, maybe the there's no battery or the battery is burned out so then you can go forward and test that hypothesis by changing the the battery and uh, so let's say you change the battery you put it in there and then it still doesn't work then you can say you falsified your hypothesis about it being the battery that was the problem so then that leads you to further questions because, man, you really want to use this flashlight. So now you come up with another hypothesis or what you might call an alternative hypothesis to further experiment with. So your next hypothesis might be that the bulb is uh, burnt out. So then you go about testing that by changing the bulb. And then let's say that now after you do that, the flashlight works. Again, you don't want to say you proved that it was uh, the bulb was burnt out. You want to say you uh, failed to falsify that hypothesis. Because what if the bulb wasn't uh, put in there correctly in, in the first place? So see how you kind of leave that room for more experimentation or for other things that might have been going on? So again, you can falsify a hypothesis, you can test a hypothesis, but you don't really prove a hypothesis. You can fail to falsify it or fail to disprove it. So here's some terms that we used on our last slides. The experimental group is what you're testing. The control group, what you compare that to. They are not exposed to what's called the independent variable. So let's go back to my plant experiment. The independent variable is the thing that I'm testing or manipulating. And so in my plant experiment, it would have been the light, or in the case of the plants in the, the cabinet, the lack of light, exposing them to just darkness. That's my independent variable, the thing I manipulate or change. So then the other part of that experiment is the dependent variable. Those are the things you measure. So I may measure the daily growth of my plants or uh, the coloration that changes as uh, they're kept in a dark cabinet for however many days. So a variable in an experiment are things that differ among individuals over time. Again, the independent variable is the thing I manipulate. The dependent is the thing that I measure. 
Basically, researchers use experiments to unravel complex natural processes by changing one variable at a time. Experiments are designed in a consistent way. That's called the scientific method. I know it looks like it's a rigid thing, but sometimes there's some variations in that, depending on what we're trying to find out. And researchers will change an independent variable and then observe the effects of change on a de dependent variable, the things that you measure. This helps determine a cause and effect relationship in a complex natural system. So there's our steps of the scientific method. Make an observation, ask a question, form a hypothesis, prediction about what's going to happen. Again, try to use deductive reasoning and if-then statement when you can. Do an experiment. You may collect different types of data. Uh, might be qualitative or quantitative. Then analyze your results. You may support your hypothesis or fail to falsify it. Or you may not support the hypothesis uh, or falsify it. And you report your results and keep trying again. And Sir Francis Bacon is credited with being the first to document that process. So some tips for good science. So a small sample size. This could often be a mistake made by uh, scientists who are just starting out is using small sample sizes. This increases your potential for a sampling error. Uh, where you a subset may be tested and it might not be representative of the whole. Okay, uh, so researchers design experiments to minimize bias as well and use probability rules to check for statistical significance. Yeah, statistics, it's hard to say that word. Statistically significant refers to a result that's statistically unlikely to have occurred by chance. So then we know the independent variable is actually affecting what it is we're testing. And probability is the chance a particular outcome of an event will occur and depends on the total number of outcomes possible. So let's go to this. I'm going to jump to uh, this right here, a couple slides down. So here's two different experiments. So our question is, how do peacock butterflies defend themselves against predatory birds. So you make an observation that you see wing flicking to show wing spots and hissing and clicking sounds. So you may predict that wing spots can scare predators or uh, sounds deter the birds. Can you come up with a hypothesis from this information? You may some say something like, um, if peacocks make hissing and clicking sounds, then it will scare predators away. So it could be something like that. So here's a practice with sampling. Let's say that we're counting jelly beans in a jar. In reality, 30% of the jelly beans are green and 70% are black, but maybe they're in a jar that we can't see through and there's too many of them to count, so we really don't know that off the top. But we do a small sample, and uh, we're trying to, pre to figure out how many or what percentage of each there are. So we reach in, we pull out one jelly bean, and it's green. So if we do just a sample size of one from that whole jar of jelly beans, and we only pull out one green one, then we have to make the assumption that all the jelly beans are green with our small sample size. So we know that's kind of ridiculous, right? Because reality, we know that there's 30% green and 70% black. But if our sample size is so small like that, then we can definitely have that mistake made. How about we do this instead? Let's sample 50 jelly beans. We pull them out, 10 of them are green, 40 are black. So now our new assumption from our, our larger sample size is 20% green, 80% black. So that's closer. It's not right on, but it's at least closer to what it was in reality. So sample size is important in science. So try not to uh, fall into that error of having a small sample size. 
along with doing your experiments. Peer review is very important in science, publishing re your results, communicating with other scientists, especially other experts in the field to make sure you are doing what I like to call good science or following the scientific method. Also trying to uh, eliminate bias. Uh, experimenters may risk interpreting results in terms of what they find out. Uh, experiments should be designed to yield data that can be counted or otherwise measured objectively. Avoiding bias. Science helps us to, if we follow the scientific method, it can help us be more objective about our observations. So opinion, whoops, opinion and belief have value in human culture, but they're not addressed by science. So subjective values such as morals or philosophy can't be tested by the scientific method. And science doesn't address the supernatural or anything beyond that. We don't have anything to really test that, at least not yet. So we don't address that. That's one of the limits of science. So some other scientific terms, is we've talked about uh, the scientific method and hypotheses. Uh, scientific theory are hypotheses that have not been disproven after many years of rigorous testing, and they can explain phenomena that happen in the world. With scientific theories, we may be adding to them often as we find new discoveries. So they can actually change. Usually it's not enough to change the whole thing, but we may find uh, little bits and pieces that we change as we gather more information and make new discoveries and, and collect more data. A law, scientific law of nature, is a generalization that describes a consistent natural phenomenon for which there is incomplete scientific explanation. Some examples of laws of nature are Newton's three laws of motion, or Kepler's laws of planetary motion, or even gravity. So the difference between basic and applied science. The debate, de excuse me, the debate continues in which one is more useful. So with basic science or pure science, it seeks to expand the knowledge. You're focused on gaining new knowledge, not really develop any, anything from it, uh, or new, no new products or new services for public or commercial value. You're exploring and figuring out new knowledge. Applied science or technology aims to use that science to solve real world problems. So you may uh, think about that, uh, like uh, basic science is the knowledge, applied science might be more of the application and both can complement one another. The Human Genome Project is an example of the link between basic and applied science. All right, now that we've finished with the notes of the chapter, I encourage you to take a look at the questions that come at the ends of the chapter. See if you can answer those. Uh, there's a few of them there. Some of them are multiple choice. Some of them are a little bit longer answer. And let me know if you have any questions.